programs that go in and try to do this. But with the PPCR, there was $50 million in grant resources saying if you complete your investment plan, you complete your strategic analysis, this investment money will be there for you. And that was a major incentive, I think, to keep these countries engaged at a very high level. Looking at MDB collaboration, again, we think this is a key achievement. It has driven changes. It's clear that the Climate Investment Fund has driven changes within the banks and how the banks relate to each other on climate change. And it has spurred common work on reporting, on harmonizing methodologies, on mainstreaming within their regular programs. And we've seen significant leverage from the um, funding coming from the MDBs. So while the CIF is putting in $7.6 billion of funding, it has leveraged $50 billion. 50 billion, of which the MDBs out of their own resources, out of their own portfolios, have put in 13.5 billion. But from a country perspective, I think the lesson that we're learning is it's not enough, that the MDBs and others need to start moving to harmonize procedures because it's too much work for the MDBs, um, for the countries that were working with one, all on a CIF program, but three different sets of procedures. Um, and as I was saying to a colleague, I think it needs to be, if you, if you have an American, if you've gone to American University, there's such a thing as a common application. You put in one application, it goes to all of the colleges. It's, I think we need to start looking at something like that to facilitate what um, is easiest for the countries. I think I'm about to run out of time, so let me very quickly just touch on one or two other points. Engaging the private sector, I know you've had a whole panel on that, but one of the things that I think is not being paid enough attention but is very important is when you are using public sector money to engage the private sector, public sector money comes with principles such as transparency and country drivenness. When you work with the private sector, they have principles of confidentiality and market competitiveness. And as long as we can't figure out how we start to talk to each other, when these private sector projects come to a, a board where the representatives are mostly from the public sector, we will continue to have conflict and misunderstanding, and it delays processes. So in, in seeking to engage the private sector, I think we have to start to have some common ground rules about expectations with regard to information and knowledge moving in advance. And finally, I just want to make one last point about mitigation and adaptation. More and more, as I, I sit in a number of these panels about climate finance, we, under the climate of the rubric of climate finance, sometimes some of us are talking about mitigation, and sometimes some of us are talking about adaptation, and we make broad sweeping statements about what works and what doesn't. They're very different. And I think that perhaps we're starting, we've reached a point where we have to start separating our discussion and our analyses of these two sources of funding, because while they're both critical to climate, the instruments and the objectives are very different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Our next speaker is Michelle Denevers. She's been introduced before, but looking here at her bio, I see that among the many things she's done is to lead the global consultations that led to the bank's climate strategy. So, Michelle, you know this deeply, and you've chosen to speak not about success, but about failure. We can always learn a lot from failure. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lawrence. Actually, well, I am going to talk about the lessons from development experience for adaptation finance and about how to spend it. So Arvind this morning in his presentation, one of the things was he said adaptation finance, no, no, no. I'm going to say adaptation finance, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I agree with Arvind that adaptation looks like development and that good adaptation is good development and good development is good adaptation. They're very closely linked. but there is an incremental cost to adaptation above and beyond a normal development trajectory that a country is on. So it's going to cost more, and that's why we need adaptation finance. Uh, how much will it cost? There was a study done in the World Bank a few years ago that estimated that the cost between 2010 and 2050 for adaptation to a two-degree Celsius world, not a four-degree, a two-degree world, was on the order of 70 to 100 billion dollars a year. So 70 to 100 billion dollars a year. Currently, the amount that was pledged in Copenhagen is 100 billion dollars a year by 2020. So you could say all of that needs to go to adaptation. 
It's also about the same order of magnitude as current levels of development assistance. So it's meant to be new and additional to development assistance, but you could say it looks like a doubling of development assistance. How much is realistic to expect? I think this morning, Nancy, we've been battering, batting around some numbers of this hundred billion. How much do we really think will come? Um, even if you took, uh, and the other thing that they said in Copenhagen is that this climate finance that should be provided, that there should be a balanced allocation between adaptation and mitigation. They didn't define what they meant by balanced adaptation in the same way they didn't define how much was going to be public and how much was going to be private. But if you thought a balance meant 50%, then that would mean $50 billion a year for adaptation, which is highly unlikely, highly unrealistic. Um, but it means compared to the 75 to 100 billion that you need, you have a shortfall before you even get started. Now of this, how much do we think would, could come from public sources? Unlike mitigation, and we've had a lot of discussion about private, you know, drawing, using public resources to draw in private investment. Unlike mitigation, many people think that the international transfers for adaptation will need to become, we need to be coming primarily from public sources, that there will be less investment in, private investment in adaptation. It kind of depends what you're talking about, what you're thinking about, but there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that many adaptation investments are really large public goods like climate proofing infrastructure or girls' education. It's also the case that most of the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change and will need adaptation finance are the poorest, and they are poor and fragile countries, and so they're not very credit worthy for private investment. So there are a couple of reasons why it would need to be disproportionately public, and we talked already about the fact that there's not enough money to go around. But since the title of this conference is How to Spend It If We Had It, let's assume we have it. Um, and assuming that you have adaptation finance, what should be the principles for how to spend it? So let's assume that we have a big pool that's earmarked for adaptation. The first thing, and this is based on a paper that Nancy Birdsall and I wrote about a year ago. The first idea we have is that there should be country allocations, that countries actually would have an entitlement to adaptation finance, and that there should be a formula for those allocations. And we think that the formula is exactly what Artur said this morning, that it should be based on physical vulnerability and income per capita as a sort of proxy for institutional capacity or the lack thereof. So if you have this formula that uh, is based on uh, vulnerability and, and income, you think, oh, that sounds a little bit like the formula for IDA. But there's a big difference that we would like to point out here. The formula for IDA allocates preferentially to those countries that have a good track record of program implementation and project performance. Um, it makes sense because they're trying to spend scarce taxpayer resources effectively. We explicitly say that should not be a criteria in allocating for adaptation finance that will deal with the question of program implementation separately. And the reason for that is because, again, these are some of the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the world, and if you were to penalize them in terms of an allocation for their inability to implement the funding properly or very effectively, you'd be penalizing them for the fact that they're poor, vulnerable, and have weak governance. So we don't want to do that. So how do you assess vulnerability? It turns out there are a number of indices of vulnerability. One was developed by our colleague here in CGD, David Wheeler. It's a, an index of vulnerability. There's an outfit in Spain called DARA that produces the climate vulnerability mo um, monitor. And then there's an index produced by the World Bank and LSE. So there are indices around that can be used that do give you kind of a, a ranking of vulnerability of countries. And then, of course, you can just use uh, income per capita. So you've got your allocation formulas. Um, one of the things that, that you note from that is that, um, as I mentioned, the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change are the poorest. And Transparency International also did an analysis the other day. Oh, I'm not even halfway. Okay. Um, I'll be fast. It's showing that um, the countries that are the most vulnerable also have the weakest governance. So you need a mechanism to get money to them 
in the face of these, these governance and capacity challenges. So how do we do this? How do they access the funds? Here's where the lessons from development assistance come in. The idea is you keep it simple, and even though um, the, it has been difficult to reform the uh, system for uh, transforming development assistance, ignore all that, learn the lessons, and move on. Have a fresh start. So it should be simple. It should be as exactly as Artur said this morning. It should be channeled through recipient countries' own budgets and systems. Uh, that recipient countries should be accountable to their citizens and not to donors for tracking the funding. There should be full transparency both to taxpayers in the funder countries and to citizens in recipient countries, and particularly in reporting on results. And ideally, you would have multilateral pool pools that would channel the funds to avoid the high transactions costs of all the hundreds of different funds that you have now. Okay, I just want to say one other thing before I give up, sorry. And that is, okay, you have these countries that what we're suggesting is that you would allocate the funds and then you just give it to them. But you give it to them in two ways. If a country meets a criteria um, and a certification that you establish for fiduciary capability, in other words, you're convinced that they know how to use the funds, track the funds, keep the funds, and not misspend the funds, then they prepare a strategy and you just fund the strategy in accordance with their country priorities. But if you come back to this group of countries and you say, well, not all of these countries have fiduciary capability, what are we going to do now? Our proposal is that countries in that situation would still have a strategy and you would fund their strategy, but they would contract with a third party uh, and outsource the implementation and management of the funds. It could be, it's somewhat analogous to the um, national implementing entities of the adaptation fund. You would have a list of pre-qualified agencies that would manage the funds. It could be NGOs, it could be consulting firms, it could be the multilateral development banks, it could be a host of agencies, but they would implement the funds on behalf of countries that did not meet the test of fiduciary capability. So that's all I'll say. Sorry, I'm out of time. Thanks very much, Michelle. What you didn't get to, you can come back to in the discussion. Um, our final speaker of the day is uh, Jonah Bush. One of the big delights for me in starting this um, work on forest is uh, getting some terrific new colleagues. Uh, Jonah is one of them. Uh, he's a research fellow at CGD, and before joining us recently, among other things, he's the lead developer of something called OSIRIS, a suite of open source software tools for estimating and mapping the benefits and costs of alternative policy decisions for reducing emissions from deforestation. Uh, and uh, be immediately before he came and joined us, he was... ...programs that go in and try to do this, but with the PPCR, there was $50 million in grant resources saying, if you complete your investment plan, you complete your strategic analysis, this investment money will be there for you. And that was a major incentive, I think, to keep these countries engaged at a very high level. Looking at MDB collaboration, again, we think this is a key achievement. It has driven changes. It's clear that the Climate Investment Fund has driven changes within the banks and how the banks relate to each other on climate change. And it has spurred common work on reporting, on harmonizing methodologies, on mainstreaming within their regular programs. And we've seen significant leverage from the um, funding coming from the MDBs. So while the CIF is putting in $7.6 billion of funding, it has leveraged 50, bil 50 billion, of which the MDBs out of their own resources, out of their own portfolios, have put in 13.5 billion. But from a country perspective, I think the lesson that we're learning is it's not enough, that the MDBs and others need to start moving to harmonize procedures because it's too much work for the MDBs um, for the countries, if we're working with one, all on a CIF program, but three different sets of procedures. Um, and as I was saying to a colleague, I think it needs to be, if you, if you have an American, if you've gone to American University, there's such a thing as a common application. You put in one application, it goes to all of the colleges. It's, I think we need to start looking at something like that to facilitate what um, is easiest for the countries. I think I'm about to run out of time, so let me very quickly just touch on one or two other points. Engaging the private sector, I know you've had a whole panel on that, but one of the things that I think is not being paid enough attention but is very important is when you are using public sector money to engage the private sector, public sector money comes with principles such as transparency and country-drivenness. When you work with the private sector, 
they have principles of confidentiality and market competitiveness. And as long as we can't figure out how we start to talk to each other, when these private sector projects come to a, a board where the representatives are mostly from the public sector, we will continue to have conflict and misunderstanding, and it delays processes. So in, in seeking to engage the private sector, I think we have to start to have some common ground rules about expectations with regard to information and knowledge moving in advance. And finally, I just want to make one last point about mitigation and adaptation. More and more, as I, I sit in a number of these panels about climate finance, we, under the climate of the rubric of climate finance, sometimes some of us are talking about mitigation, and sometimes some of us are talking about adaptation, and we make broad sweeping statements about what works and what doesn't. They're very different. And I think that perhaps we're starting, we've reached a point where we have to start separating our discussion and our analyses of these two sources of funding, because while they're both critical to climate, the instruments and the objectives are very different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Our next speaker is Michelle Denevers. She's been introduced before, but looking here at her bio, I see that among the many things she's done is to lead the global consultations that led to the bank's climate strategy. So, Michelle, you know this deeply, and you've chosen to speak not about success, but about failure. We can always learn a lot from failure. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lawrence. Actually, well, I am going to talk about the lessons from development experience for adaptation finance and about how to spend it. So Arvind this morning in his presentation, one of the things was he said adaptation finance, no, no, no. I'm going to say adaptation finance, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I agree with Arvind that adaptation looks like development and that good adaptation is good development and good development is good adaptation. They're very closely linked. but there is an incremental cost to adaptation above and beyond a normal development trajectory that a country is on. So it's going to cost more, and that's why we need adaptation finance. Uh, how much will it cost? There was a study done in the World Bank a few years ago that estimated that the cost between 2010 and 2050 for adaptation to a two degree Celsius world, not a four degree, a two degree world, was on the order of 70 to 100 billion dollars a year. So 70 to 100 billion dollars a year. Currently, the amount that was pledged in Copenhagen is 100 billion dollars a year by 2020. So you could say all of that needs to go to adaptation. It's also about the same order of magnitude as current levels of development assistance. So it's meant to be new and additional to development assistance, but you could say it looks like a doubling of development assistance. How much is realistic to expect? I think this morning, Nancy, we've been battering, batting around some numbers of this 100 billion. How much do we really think will come? Um, even if you took, uh, and the other thing that they said in Copenhagen is that this climate finance that should be provided, that there should be a balanced allocation between adaptation and mitigation. They didn't define what they meant by balanced adaptation in the same way they didn't define how much was going to be public and how much was going to be private. But if you thought a balance meant 50 percent, then that would mean $50 billion a year for adaptation, which is highly unlikely, highly unrealistic. Um, but it means compared to the 75 to 100 billion that you need, you have a shortfall before you even get started. Now of this, how much do we think would, could, come from public sources. Unlike mitigation, and we've had a lot of discussion about private, you know, drawing, using public resources to draw in private investment. Unlike mitigation, many people think that the international transfers for adaptation will need to become, we need to be coming primarily from public sources, that there will be less investment in, private investment in adaptation. It kind of depends what you're talking about, what you're thinking about, but there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that many adaptation investments are really large public goods like climate proofing infrastructure or girls education. It's also the case that most of the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change and will need adaptation finance are the poorest and they are poor and fragile countries and so they're not very credit worthy for private investment. So there are a couple of reasons why it would need to be disproportionately public. 
and we talked already about the fact that there's not enough money to go around. But since the title of this conference is How to Spend It If We Had It, let's assume we have it. Um, and assuming that you have adaptation finance, what should be the principles for how to spend it? So let's assume that we have a big pool that's earmarked for adaptation. The first thing, and this is based on a paper that Nancy Birdsall and I wrote about a year ago. The first idea we have is that there should be country allocations, that countries actually would have an entitlement to adaptation finance, and that there should be a formula for those allocations. And we think that the formula is exactly what Artur said this morning, that it should be based on physical vulnerability and income per capita as a sort of proxy for institutional capacity or the lack thereof. So if you have this formula that uh, is based on uh, vulnerability and, and income, you think, oh, that sounds a little bit like the formula for IDA. But there's a big difference that we would like to point out here. The formula for IDA allocates preferentially to those countries that have a good track record of program implementation and project performance. Um, it makes sense because they're trying to spend scarce taxpayer resources effectively. We explicitly say that should not be a criteria in allocating for adaptation finance that will deal with the question of program implementation separately. And the reason for that is because, again, these are some of the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the world, and if you were to penalize them in terms of an allocation for their inability to implement the funding properly or very effectively, you'd be penalizing them for the fact that they're poor, vulnerable, and have weak governance. So we don't want to do that. So how do you assess vulnerability? It turns out there are a number of indices of vulnerability. One was developed by our colleague here in CGD, David Wheeler. It's a, an index of vulnerability. There's an outfit in Spain called DARA that produces the climate vulnerability mo um, monitor. And then there's an index produced by the World Bank and LSE. So there are indices around that can be used that do give you kind of a, a ranking of vulnerability of countries. And then, of course, you can just use uh, income per capita. So you've got your allocation formulas. Um, one of the things that, that you note from that is that, um, as I mentioned, the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change are the poorest. And Transparency International also did an analysis the other day. Oh, I'm not even halfway. Okay. Um, I'll be fast. It's showing that um, the countries that are the most vulnerable also have the weakest governance. So you need a mechanism to get money to them in the face of these, these governance and capacity challenges. So how do we do this? How do they access the funds? Here's where the lessons from development assistance come in. The idea is you keep it simple, and even though um, the, it has been difficult to reform the uh, system for uh, transforming development assistance, ignore all that, learn the lessons, and move on. Have a fresh start. So it should be simple. It should be as exactly as our tour said this morning. It should be channeled through recipient countries' own budgets and systems. Uh, that recipient countries should be accountable to their citizens and not to donors for tracking the funding. There should be full transparency both to taxpayers in the funder countries and to citizens in recipient countries, and particularly in reporting on results. And ideally, you would have multilateral pool pools that would channel the funds to avoid the high transactions costs of all the hundreds of different funds that you have now. Okay, I just want to say one other thing before I... Up, sorry, And that is, okay, you have these countries that, that what we're suggesting is that you would allocate the funds and then you just give it to them. But you give it to them in two ways. If a country meets a criteria um, and a certification that you establish for fiduciary capability, in other words, you're convinced that they know how to use the funds, track the funds, keep the funds, and not misspend the funds, then they prepare a strategy and you just fund the strategy in accordance with their country priorities. But if you come back to this group of countries and you say, well, not all of these countries have fiduciary capability, what are we going to do now? Our proposal is that countries in that situation would still have a strategy and you would fund their strategy, but they would contract with a third party uh, and outsource the implementation and management of the funds. It could be, it's somewhat analogous to the um, national implementing entities of the adaptation fund. You would have a list of pre-qualified agencies that would manage the funds. It could be NGOs, it could be 
consulting firms, it could be the multilateral development banks, it could be a host of agencies, but they would implement the funds on behalf of countries that did not meet the test of fiduciary capability. So that's all I'll say. Sorry, I'm out of time. Thanks very much, Michelle. What you didn't get to, you can come back to in the discussion. Um, our final speaker of the day is uh, Jonah Bush. One of the big delights for me in starting this um, work on forest is uh, getting some terrific new colleagues. Uh, Jonah is one of them. Uh, he's a research fellow at CGD, and before joining us recently, among other things, he's the lead developer of something called OSIRIS, a suite of open source software tools for estimating and mapping the benefits and costs of alternative policy decisions for reducing emissions from deforestation. Uh, and uh, be immediately before he came and joined us, he was at the uh, bu 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 Conservation International. Uh, Jonah, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, thanks, everyone. Entire day. Uh, I know it's it's been a long day, a great day, a lot to take in. Um, and so, as now the the tea in Francis's uh, BLT sandwich coming after everything else in the sandwich, I'm going to do uh, two things to try to make sure that I hold your attention uh, for the for the last seven minutes. So, one is cute graphics. Two is I'll get straight to the point. So the title is, What Have We Learned from Red? My answer to that question is, we've learned a three-phased approach, both to emission reductions and finance, starting with uh, readiness, moving to large-scale pay-for-performance pilot programs, and finally to the transaction of emission reductions. And that's a concept I'll explain in greater detail. And of course, the second question, the topic of this entire conference is how to spend it if we had it. And my proposition is we're now in the second phase of uh, forests and red. What we need now is accelerated finance for payment for performance partnerships at large scale in multiple places. And I'll come back to this. We've got some great models here that are already uh, being tried and showing results. Norway's uh, bilateral, uh, a for former member of Norway's uh, International Climate and Forest Initiative is here, Andreas. Um, the Carbon Fund of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility uh, and the offset programs of California and Japan. I'll come back to these as well. Uh, so let me remind everyone about the, the premise of RED reducing emissions from deforestation plus sequestering carbon and regrowing forests. Um, there, this premise here is a transaction, uh, a partnership between develop, developing countries here on the left with forests and developed countries on the right with, uh, what I'm, real, I'm realizing we're looking at an older version now, the, the slideshow, than, than the latest one that I sent. But that, That'll be okay. All right. Um, so, so these with us has a terrific paper in which he argues that um, investment in girls, particularly in uh, education, middle school education for girls, is very highly effective from a climate point of view because of the reduced fertility. So, the center has some work on that. Um, that's the first question. I guess it was directed at Patricia, perhaps, but there may be others uh, on the panel who have views about that. Okay, just so, and would you like me to just answer that one, let others answer, or go through the floor? Let's just take the one. Okay. Um, yes, uh, gender has been raised, and, and we're very pleased to see it raised vigorously by our boards. And I think in the pilot program on climate resilience, there's a fairly good track record. It's not consistent across the board, but we do have um, a number of countries who, who were very actively looking at gender issues as they developed their plans and their investments. In the mitigation field, I think it's still an area where there's a room for lots of development and case studies, and it's something we're working on. We, uh, we're fortunate that the board just um, approved funding for us to have a gender specialist in our team. Uh, the MDBs have all, in the last few years, I think, developed very robust gender policies. Now the trick is to implement them. But it, in adaptation, it's not a hard sell, but we find in mitigation, they say, oh, we're building a power plant. What are the gender implications of that, right? So, so there's a lot of room for improvement, but it is a policy that we're hearing they want attention paid to it. it 
unfortunately it wasn't there when we started in 2008. I'm glad it's there now and it's important that it stay there in all future climate architecture. And you actually you just roll through the second question was for you. How did we get the common app now that it's 2015? The common app, common app for climate finance. Right. Um, if there's a GCF, I think that's a great role for the GCF to play, to develop a common app. Working on experience from the MDBs, you know, it's going to have to be a balance. Michelle said, keep it simple, fresh look at things. So I, I do think there's a lot of barnacles that have grown up with development finance that maybe we don't, aren't relevant in climate finance. Um, but I think it, it, or I also think if we could get the MDBs themselves to do it, it, it would sp you could start with climate and hopefully spread, spread throughout all of development finance because even though they have many of the same countries on the same members on board, same countries represented on their boards, they all have their different procedures and I know it drives developing countries crazy. So I think it can be an MDB exercise, but for all of climate finance, if the GCF ever gets off the ground, it could be a GCF um, job, yes. I think. It might be interesting, not for now, because maybe somebody does know the answer here, but I'm wondering how the Common App came about, given the many hundreds of universities that now use it. There sounds like there's a coordination issue there they solved in some way. Um, Nancy's question had to do with a sort of a shuffle of responsibility, and I imagine everybody here knows when people say GCF, they're talking about the new Green Climate Fund, which is in the process of moving from bond to soul, and there were re remarks earlier in the day saying that uh, things are not going so well in a meeting in Paris in terms of actually raising money for it. Nancy was suggesting maybe, I guess if I understood correctly, taking one of the smaller funds within the climate investment funds that focuses on adaptation, putting it in the Green Climate Fund, having a sort of a rational rationalization of who does what. Um, she's not shaking her head, so I think I got it right. GCF does adaptation. Let's, let's hear from Michelle since she spoke about adaptation and I suspect has views on this and we'll come back to you, Patricia. Um, I think that's a great idea for a couple of reasons. Um, as uh, our private panel mentioned this morning, the difficulties of trying to organize private funding through the GCF and the window and the problems that Patricia mentioned. And so, um, and a lot of mitigation uh, actions I think will be privately funded. So I, so that's one. Two, I think that a lot of the adaptation finance, as I mentioned, will be public. So it's the way that GCF is developing, evolving, it looks like a agency that would be well suited to administer public budgetary funds. Um, and I think moving the PPCR over there would be a good idea. We'd give them something to do. Um, it, it's not a crazy idea. Uh, there's certainly, I have been and others spending lots of time talking about different ways the SIF could merge into the GCF or be combined to the GCF or live side next by the GCF. And, and I'm often recall that in that famous Copenhagen decision, there is a line that says a significant proportion of funding for adaptation will flow through the GCF. It gets lost a lot of times, but it is in there. Um, and so I think there were thoughts that the GCF should be looking predominantly at adaptation and the needs of, of very poor countries. Um, so it, I just, if that were to happen, I hope that the banks in their, in their development assistance, the IDAs and their equivalent would also, however, continue the pressure to make all of their assistant climate smart as well because it does have to be mainstream across the board. And I think that's one of the benefits of the PPCR and now and a lot of the knowledge we're putting into the IDA discussions, we're trying to push the PPCR model as something to show that significant things can be done if you get the development financing right. Um, Joan, I have a question for you. We've, we've arrived safely in the land of tomorrow. It's 2020, and I want you to just briefly, very quickly, say what that land looked like, since we don't have the slide in front of us, or maybe I can pull it up, and then tell us how we got there. What were some of the things that happened in order to achieve that reasonable but very optimistic goal that you would like us to achieve in terms of uh, forest finance? Yeah, thanks. So. The world of 2020 uh, with RED means there have to be uh, serious, ambitious emission reduction targets uh, in the northern countries. 
and that could be manifested uh, through uh, caps on emissions. It could be manifested through uh, carbon price taxing and pricing. Uh, but there's there's demand uh, from the politicians leading northern countries for emission reductions. Uh, without that, at a large scale, uh, red red keeps waiting in the pilot phase. Now, why is this pilot phase important for when we? Th th that's the that's the if we had it. That's what that's the that's the it. And if we had it, is these the demand for emission reductions. Now, how we got there, what what the world looks like on the red side, how they're being generated. Some of these sailboats, some of these models uh, are faster than others. They're perceived as successful, and they start being replicated. So uh, the Brazil-Norway model, uh, where Brazil reduced its emissions by 80% in the last decade, um, you, you, there's, uh, you, you maybe Argentina says, there's no reason we can't do that. Um, whereas the California model with, um, with, with right now the states of Acre and Chiapas, there, that gets piled on to as well. So Oregon and Colorado and Quebec say, this works for us, we can buy into it. And other states in the governor's uh, climate task force buy into it as well. And so state, other states in Brazil, states in Nigeria, states in Indonesia say, we can be selling through this, this program. And I would say, um, as I look at US history of environmental legislation, seen that California has often been the leading edge of what becomes U.S. climate policy. Happen for uh, automobile emission regulation, this could be what happens for RED. The California model could ultimately, once other states join, once their pressure could become the United States model. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to do a lightning round of questions and comments from the floor and then give each of our panelists uh, about 90 seconds to respond to whatever they want or make a closing statement. Um, I did see a few other hands around the room. Um, did I imagine them? Yes, no, this, we, we, so we have Andre here. Oh, excuse me, Artur, excuse me, I apologize. Um, Dan, gentleman in the back. Nancy, we'll give you the last word. And um, our friend from um, in, Environmental Defense. My question uh, is for um, uh, John, Mr. John. Uh, John, the f when I started dealing with climate change issues uh, some years ago, the first thing that someone told me in the Brazilian government is that everyone is trying to solve with forests the problem of emissions from from uh, fossil fuels. Uh, how uh, how much do you think this this issue has has really evolved? that uh, uh, the, the problem in terms of reducing emissions versus uh, 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 keeping stocks of carbons, uh, how much you see the, the, the possibility of having access to finance for both things and how this is going to fit into the, in, into the it's, it's sorry for this complicated question, not very, not very clear, but, but how do you think this will actually uh, be uh, uh, um, there will be f fungibility with the with the, the, the int with the system the, uh, um, as a whole. So, how you can guarantee that all these payments uh, are really translating to uh, emission of uh, reductions, and we are really moving towards uh, 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 a world with less carbon, or or just keeping stocks are not really uh, helping much. Thank you very much. No, I think that it was, it was clear to me. Was the question clear to you, John? Yeah. Dan. Uh, for Patricia, you had mentioned that at the beginning of the CTF, the attempt to have a programmatic approach seemed to work pretty well. Governments got their programs together, the MDBs coordinated, but that over time that's degraded. Do you have any insights about how to um, boost that programmatic approach? And are there some countries that have been able to maintain it more effectively, countries, not the MDBs, that might have lessons for other countries. Mm 
that to the answer. All right, I think there's somebody in the back. Sir, so put your hand up so you can bring the microphone to you. Thank you. Um, sh uh, how should the World Bank uh, make any reforms to achieve some of the uh, goals being t discussed, in particular um, allocation formulas and or governance that takes account of private sector flows? Was that for Patricia? Patricia or, or Michelle, either either one, they both know a little bit about that. Did, could, could you maybe repeat the question? It wasn't very very clear here. And, and remind us who you are, I apologize. Sure. My name is Alan Lee, I'm with Climate Change in the World Bank. Um, my question for, um, for Patricia and Michelle uh, was um, what reforms would you like to see in the way the World Bank operates in terms of uh, to address some of these challenges, for example, um, the allocation formulas in IDA and or governance structures that can take account of private sector flows. Um, I think um, uh, Patricia made the point that um, the, the, of the differences between private and um, pro pu uh, public funds transparency versus confidentiality um, and uh, country-driven versus profit-driven. And, and if I may abuse the prerogative as the chair, I, in my reading of the World Bank's new climate strategy, it identifies uh, climate as one of four cross-cutting thematic issues that will be separate and apart from the new proposed global practices. Two of the other ones, is, as you certainly know, uh, Patricia, are gender and uh, another one has to do with violence, uh, cl climate, and then there's a fourth. Gotcha. Fragile, fragile in uh, states. So I'd be interested in this question about what does the bank need to do, whether that proposed new structure in your view is something that is going to be um, helpful and strengthen the focus on climate or, or, or will make no difference or will make things worse. Uh, yes, please. Hi, uh, Ruben Lebowski, EDF. Uh, just a question about uh, any reflections or lessons learned about engaging the private sector, which is something we heard a lot about earlier, but didn't hear that much about in this panel. And then uh, just a comment about how we're going to get there in terms of red. I think it's, um, you know, what Jonah talked about in terms of demand from markets in developed countries is really important, but I also think it's important to think about the possible role of internal markets and internal domestic policies in developing countries that may be interested in using red uh, for their own domestic reasons, as well as maybe just industrial sectors generally, whether within developing or developed countries. Um, Nancy, if yours is a question, I'll take it now. And if it's a closing remark, I'll have you speak after we, I wrap up the panel. Which is, you know, nice to hear and interesting. Would it work if? if California or the US or Germany had a carbon tax as opposed to a, a carbon market, how would it work? Um, so there's a range of questions. I'm not going to unpack, attempt to unpack them, but I think what I'll do since we started with Patricia is start this time with Jonah and come across the table and you can respond to any, all, or none of the questions and comments from the floor and you've got about 90 seconds each. Sure. Thanks. So. Uh, Take the questions in reverse order. How would uh, RED work if the US or California had a carbon tax? It would work very similar to the same way it would work if regulated firms had a, uh, a ceiling on the amount of emissions they could, they could emit, meaning that if, they have a, if, if they're taxed per unit of carbon uh, that they generate, if they're able to buy um, units of emission reductions from red or other sources and they can count that on their balance sheet against what they emitted at home then they could be reducing their pre-tax the, the burden of the carbon tax from you know a thousand tons to 500 tons to, to pick numbers so I'd, I'd see it as a uh, yeah we, we don't have to start over we, we use the same system um, on how to uh, on red, making sure that red contributes to an overall emission reduction package. For sure, we need to see big emission reductions from the fossil fuel uh, using sectors that we heard about all day. Uh, so red, if applied properly, is not a substitute for those actions. Uh, rather, it's a deal sweetener that makes that politically and economically makes an overall package uh, p cheaper and potentially more ambitious. And I can give examples from the, the past of how it's how it's done so. Um, I, I want to use the, the last second to reiterate a point that Frances made over lunch. She showed two slides, two very uh, 
satellite imagery looking slides, one used use from a satellite called MODIS, one from a satellite called Landsat. And I want to make sure everybody realizes uh, the, the, the seismic shift that's about to happen in our ability to uh, monitor what's going on in forests better than any time in human history. So these to date have been technologies that have basically only been available in Brazil. That's part of the big head start Brazil has had. They've had annual uh, very good accurate estimates of how much deforestation has taken place and they've had bi-weekly uh, alerts on where deforestation is taking place. And they use these in slightly different ways. The alerts to send out law enforcement and make sure people are complying with the laws that are on the books. Uh, and the deforestation to then prove to the world that there's been this success. Now, in other parts of the world, these alerts haven't existed at all, and the deforestation estimates have been released every five years or every 10 years, if at all. Now, both of those are about to change, um, and that's going to be uh, you know, released to the public, among other ways, uh, under something called Global Forest Watch, uh, being housed at World Resources Institute. And then every country and the stakeholder groups inside and outside of those countries will have at their disposal uh, the type of technologies that have partially led to Brazil being able to do what it's done. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to see that, that happen. And thanks very much, Jonah. Um, it's nice to end on a hopeful note. Michelle. Um, <clears throat> I would say a couple things. On the reforms of the World Bank on IDA, uh, I didn't want to imply that there was anything wrong with the IDA allocation formula for what it is. It's development assistance. It's not, I didn't think the formula was right for adaptation finance because adaptation finance is not development assistance. That development assistance is a voluntary contribution. Adaptation finance we think should be sort of a, a bl obligation on the part of, part of the countries that created the solution. So they're very, very different. Within the IDA allocation, I think the big reform that needs to happen is that, and this is consistent with a lot of work that's been done at CGD, is right now all the funding goes to individual countries. There's almost no funding that's available to address regional problems, and there is no funding available to address global problems. So I would say that the allocation formula needs to be revised to allow for funding um, regional and, and global public goods. On the private-public thing, um, what I've heard from a lot of engagement with um, with private parties in attempting to set up public-private partnerships is that the public, th that basically they need to let the private sector take more of a lead. Instead of the public sector coming in and telling them what to do and you know organizing the deal the way they would organize a public sector deal, there needs to be a bit more, um, I think, um, letting the private sector be a little bit more in the driver's seat. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Patricia. Okay, on the programmatic approach, I, again, going back, I think in the pilot program for climate resilience, you can see many successes, Zambia, Mozambique, Tajikistan, countries that don't usually lead, you think it's leading as models, um, because it, it was a, clear that adaptation is cross-sectoral. They had to deal with different ministries. Secondly, for those countries, $50 million in grants and potentially 50 to $60 million in very concessional lending was significant. So it meant that the Ministry of Finance was paying attention. And I think that's critical if you have these committees and you have it's either in the prime minister's office or the development planning or finance as opposed to environment. I think you get more traction and more integration. More money help always. Um, and one of the things in PPCR is they actually have took some of their allocation to fund the government to stay engaged moving forward, whereas in the big mitigation plans, the Department of Energy, so just all the money went to the projects and no one thought they were responsible for anything anymore other than the project managers. Now through our results framework saying you have to report on a programmatic level of what's going on and the country has to do that, they're all saying, hold on a minute, you haven't given us resources to do it. And it's, it's, I think it's fair they need to be resourced to do it. It's just we didn't think early on to provide them with the resources. So I think it is part of a resource question that these countries, at least to kickstart it, need, need resources. Um, I would say on IDA, I would love to see vulnerability become part of the IDA formula. IDA formula is kind of like the third rail. You can't touch it. 
they're opening up for fragile states, and I thought, well, that's an issue, and maybe there's an op if it can open up for fragile states, maybe they can open it up for vulnerability. But I think it is something one should be looking at, and it surely, surely would change the world for small island development states who are kind of in Ida in a funny way. So I, I actually would favor adding vulnerability to their index. And on the reform of the bank, I think it all remains to be seen. It's all rumors. We're all guessing. Let's keep our fingers crossed. It's a good thing. <laughs> Thank Lawrence and Michelle and other staff at CGD who did such a good job. For those of you who are still here can agree with me. It's been a fantastic day. I must say I've been on a very steep learning curve. Absolutely great. Thank you, Lawrence, Michelle, the panelists, and all the prior pr panelists, and all of you who asked good questions. Let us go forth <laughs> and think more about how to spend it when we have it. And to that, I have only to add that there is, in fact, a reception. Please do stay and continue to discuss. Thank you.